This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Why is it that some people give and they seem to get blessed and other people don't? I mean, if, it, if all it was to it is give and it shall be given unto you, would nobody have no financial problem because you give. And why is that? You know it's got to be a lot more. It's a motive behind. Motive. God wants your motive. Your motive is more valuable to Him than the gift. And we're not understanding that. It's more valuable to Him than the gift. I want you to look at your life, your family, your friendships, your job, your hobbies, every single piece that makes up your life, God cares about it. And I'm on a mission to show you how to take back the victory in all those pieces. How every single piece of your life is covered under this grace. So join me July 6th through the 10th for Grace Life 2020. Register now at CreflodollarMinistries.org. And remember, no peace left behind. This is your world. So let's Most Christian relationship is all about what I can get from him to me. Yeah. It's all about what can I get from him to me. And I think what has happened is, is we have drastically confused the essence of our relationship with God with the benefits. And we're no longer after God. We're after what he can do for us. We're after what the Lord can do for us. The whole thing, Christianity is about a relationship. It's not, it's, not a, it's not about what you can get from him, but that's all it is. It's all about, and if God doesn't, anytime you seek the benefits over the essence of relationship, you know, I use the illustration with my wife. I'm glad I didn't marry her just for the benefits because what would happen if I marry her and, and some kind of, you know, God forbid, injury or something happens and I'm no, I'm no longer able to hold her hand, I'm no longer able to have sex with her, I'm no longer able to, to, to reap the benefits of the relationship, if I sought her just for the benefits, then that relationship's probably over with. But I didn't come together with her just for the benefits. I want to be with her. Like I told you before, she's not one of the women I could live with, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. She was the one I can't live without. You understand what I'm saying? Get the one you can't live without. And I just want to be with her. So anything happen, I'm there. I'm still there. I'm still there without the benefits because the benefits, it wasn't my motivation in the first place. It was the essence of the relationship that was my motivation in the first place. Well, it's the same thing where God is concerned. What was your motivation for becoming a Christian? What was your motivation for having a relationship with God? Was it because he could bless you with a house or bless you with a car or he could bless you with money or he could heal you or he could deliver you? What was the motivation behind why you became a Christian? See, I'm like the Apostle Paul. It's none of those things. It's not benefit-driven. It's the intimacy of knowing him. It's the intimacy of knowing that because of him, I've been made righteous. Because of him, I'm delivered up out of a ditch. Because of him, I'm born again, and I'm saved, and heaven's my home. It's because of him. I have a relationship with him. So when I die and, and, I, and, I, and I walk right past him, I don't know who he is. I don't want to seek him for the benefits, and then when I die, I don't even know who he is. I have no idea who it is. I don't know if it was, you know that was Jesus. I don't know if it was Jesus. <laughs> but most Christians in the body of Christ are benefit-driven. People join the church because they're benefit-driven. They're not joining because, oh, it's an opportunity for me to know God more. They're joining because, hmm, let me see what I can get out of this. Hmm, I got a business. Let me see if I can use a church. All the wrong reasons. And you know what happens? You know, there was a woman in the book of Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20, and she bought two of her sons, Matthew 20 and 20. Could you put that up real quick? In Matthew 20 and 20, she bought two of her sons, and she wanted to meet with Jesus, and, but she had the wrong motivation. 
Look at Matthew chapter 20. He says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him. Why was she worshiping him? And desiring a certain thing of him. Ah, worshiping him. But look, with the look at the motivation for her worship. She wanted a favor. She wanted a favor. And look at what happened in verse 23. It was rejected. Matthew 20, 23. 23. And he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand, that was her request, and on my left hand, he says, that's not, that's not mine to give. He said, that only comes from God. See, when you go to God with the wrong motivation, you may discover rejection is there. It was the wrong motivation. It's the wrong motivation. So you're giving because somebody says you're going to get rich because you give? Or you're giving because you're grateful and thankful that God has already blessed you. What is your motivation for being a Christian? What's your motivation for being here? I sure hope it's bigger than the benefit. I sure hope that the benefit never outweighs your personal relationship with God. I sure hope that the essence of an intimate relationship with God becomes your motivation in everything because when that becomes your ultimate motivation in everything you do, then the benefits are right behind that. They're right behind that. You will never, it's, it's like jumping in a swimming pool. You never have to sit there and contemplate, will I get wet? Why? All you got to do is what? Jump in the pool. And so likewise, if you'll get an intimate relationship with the Lord God, you won't have to sit there and, and negotiate with whether or not you're going to, to, to be blessed. It happens because of the relationship. Turn to two people and tell them, I am in it for the relationship. I'm in it for the relationship. Amen? Amen? Now, there is no genuine worship without gift giving. There is no genuine worship without gift giving. Giving itself is an act of worship. Now, we know the real reason. You remember the, the, the Magi? They came to Jesus. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 2 and 11. The Magi came to Jesus. Those were the, the, the kings that saw the star in the east. And uh, they came to Jesus. And there's something so interesting happened here that by the time they found him, he was about one or two. And look at this, man. You know, they had gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I'm like, well, why did they bring the gifts? Because they were trying to help Jesus pay his electric bill? Why, why, did, why, would, why did they show up with gifts? Why didn't they just show up? Why did, why did they have to bring gifts? And the Bible never told us how much they bought. There were kings coming to the king of kings, and they showed up with gifts. Now, watch this. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young man, child, the young, the young child with Mary, his mother. So they saw Jesus. And what does the Bible say they did? They did what? They fell down, and they did what? And they worshiped him, colon. Now, my, why am I mentioning the colon? Because it's going to explain to us how they worshiped him. They, they, they bowed down, they fell down, and they worshiped him. All right, this is so significant. And when they had opened their treasure, did you see that? They fell down, they worshiped him. Question, when did they worship him? When they opened their treasures. When they opened their treasures. You see what happened? They took the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, and they used that to worship him. That blew my mind. They took they, they came to Jesus, fell down. The Bible says they worshiped them, colon. Watch this. They worshiped them, colon. How? When they opened their treasures. When they opened their treasures. You see, your giving, your, your, your worship is not genuine worship without the giving of gifts. I didn't make that up. He did. I didn't make that up. Try to get your money. That's what you just read in the Bible. If kings knew to worship him with their treasures. I think it's time for Christians to know that we worship him with our treasures. Amen. Are you listening to me? And that treasure in the Bible is not always money. That treasure was sometimes something that was more valuable than money. Look at Genesis chapter 22. Look at Genesis chapter 22. And in Genesis chapter 22, you see Abraham, who already has demonstrated how he worshiped God when he won the battle of the kings. And the Bible says that the Lord has delivered your enemies into your hands. 
And right after that, that, that statement, the Lord, Abraham, the Lord delivered, delivered your enemies into your hands. And the Bible said, and Abraham gave tithes of all, all that he won in the, thing, in the, in, in, in the, in the battle. We've been missing something. Even when we give, we bucket plunk. There's not even a thought to worship God with our gift. It's sometimes, well, I'm going to give, praise the Lord, thank you, or I don't want to, but I'm going to do it anyway. And because we think that we're giving to get, we think that we're scratching God's back, and we don't realize what I am giving is something that God has allowed to come into my life, and it is representing my health. It's representing everything, and I need to take some time over my treasure to say, thank you, God. I worship you, God. I praise you because of what I am saying. I'm not saying that you no longer can get your harvest, but what I am saying is if you don't change your motivation behind your giving, it's always going to be zero. Other than that, why is it that some people give and they seem to get blessed and other people don't? I mean, if, it, if all it was to it is give and it shall be given unto you, would nobody have no financial problems because you give? What's going on? I give. It ain't been given unto me. How many of y'all have given before and it hadn't been given unto you? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to see your hand. <laughs> I already know. And why is that? You know it's got to be a lot more. It's a motive behind. Motive. God wants your motive. Your motive is more valuable to him than the gift. And we're not understanding that. It's more valuable to him than the gift. Look at what happened here to Abraham. It came to pass after these things God did tempt Abram, Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. So God's getting ready to take him through the same test that David mentioned in Chronicles where he says, I'm going to test your heart. I'm going to see if I give something to you, will you worship me because of what I gave to you? He says, I'll give you houses you didn't build. I'll give you wells you didn't dig. Just don't forget me. Verse 2, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Now, you know the story behind Isaac, 100-year-old man, 90-year-old uh, woman, her womb's dead, everything's dead, didn't nothing happen that night in that tent until God came up in that tent, amen? And he blessed him, empowered him to do what he couldn't do in the natural. Hallelujah. Take now thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there, offer him there, so the gift is going to be his only son. God gave to him. Will you be willing to worship me with what I gave to you? How are you going to withhold from God what came from him in the first place? How are you going to withhold from God what came to him in the first place? He said, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell thee of. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for a burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place in which God had told him. Next verse. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. Verse 5. Abraham said unto his young man, men, watch this, abide ye here with the ass. Now, you know, that's the, that's the donkey. That's the, I'm not cussing. Y'all say, look at the preacher in here just, just cussing, just ass, ass. That's just, I, I'm not cussing. It's, 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 it's a donkey. <laughs> I ain't going to that church no more. He said ass twice. <laughs> I'm just, just reading the Bible, you know. <laughs> and Abraham said unto his young men, abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad, watch, he said, I am the lad, he's referring to Isaac, oh my God, we will go yonder, whoa, 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 look what he said we were going to do, and what? All right, what were they actually going to go do? What were they actually going to go do? They were going to sacrifice his son as a gift or an offering to God. And Abraham called this worship. Abraham called it worship. 
We thought worship was limited to singing and dancing, and that's a part of worship, and praying, and all the things we do in the worship service. But Abraham said, I'm going to offer God a very valuable gift, something he gave to me. I'm going to offer it back to him. But what he said to the guys with him, he said, me and Isaac, we going to worship God. But since I have a relationship with him, I know God's going to have to do something because he says, I'm going to have a seed that outnumbers the stars. So I'm telling you right now, I have faith in what God's already done. So we're coming back. Amen. We're going to go and worship. We're going to go and worship. Some of y'all so scared to give anything to God because you think he's trying to take something from you because you think he needs something from you. And all God wants to see is, I gave it to you. Will you at least worship me with what I gave to you? Yeah, isn't it time for you to go? I mean, dear God, hurry up. Some people, I, I don't know, I can't get it in their head that God doesn't need your stuff. Look at Psalms 50. I'll just show you one. Look at Psalms 50, verse 10 through 12. <laughs> well, what, 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 what God need with my money? What God need with my son? What God? You, you don't understand. God don't need nothing from frail you. God doesn't need you to be God. You need God. God doesn't need you to be who he is. You need him to be who you are. Amen. Don't get it twisted. You can get mad at God. I'm mad at God. Well, you're the only one still jacked up, stranded on the side of the road. <laughs> you mad at the only one that can help you. Amen. Seriously? Amen. I'm mad at God because he did that. I'm mad at God because he let that happen. I'm mad at God because I don't understand that. Y you, don't, you think you heard God? You ain't heard God? Well, I ain't coming to church no more. I ain't going to have nothing else to do with God. You the one stranded. Because you have strife against the only one that can help you. Look at what he said. He said, for every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle upon the thousand hills, mine. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> Why? For the world is mine, and the fullness thereof is mine. God, like, I don't need you. Look at Acts chapter 17, 24 and 25. It's all over the Scripture. Your God is mighty. God don't need your money. What God need with my money? He don't. That's what I'm telling you. He don't. It's what's behind it. He wants to know you want him because you want him. You ain't testing him. You ain't testing him. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, verse 25, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Uh-uh. Can, can I show you one more? Real quick. Look at Romans 11, 35 and 36. Let's look at that in the NLT. Romans, God, this is not, well, I, even though they sacrificed and they gave gifts to God in the Old Covenant, he's talking about giving gifts to God now, it's not the physical gift. It's the act of worship. I like this, verse 35. And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? <laughs> For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Look at this in the message real quick. This is, you got to get that out your head. And people who don't have a relationship with God, and they just, they hate giving because mammon has gripped their life. And they, mammon says, trust money, don't trust God. Mammon says, need money, don't need God. And when you're on a mammon, you'll do anything to get it. Look what he says here. Have you ever come on any 
Have you ever, have you ever come on anything quite like this extravagant generosity of God, this deep, deep wisdom? It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a huge favor that God has to ask him advice? <laughs> Everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. It's always glory. It's always praise. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Some of y'all look at me like, what the heck? <laughs> All right, go back to, where were we? Genesis 22. Genesis 22. So, this act of worship is going on, and it was to bring a gift to God, to give to God what God had already given to Abraham and his son. Genesis chapter 22, and uh, whatever the verse was. He says, And Abraham said unto him, verse 5, uh, about ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse 26, now let me show you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hands and a knife, and they went both of them together. Verse 7, and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? And Abraham wanted to say, you it, boy. <laughs> he says, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, we talk about Abraham's faith. Imagine how much faith Isaac had to have that his father wasn't, you know, missing some stuff. Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, look what he said, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. We're just going to worship him. Now, now, understand Abraham and God were covenant partners. God cut a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. The covenant partnership says this, whatever one covenant partner requires of you, the other one has got to be willing to do the same thing. So, if God asked for Abraham to sacrifice his only son, there will come a day where God would have to sacrifice his only son. If God tells Abraham to go to a specific spot in Moriah, Golgotha's hill, then God would have to present the sacrifice at the same, the same spot that Abraham did. So he said to him, where's the lamb? He said, God's going to provide the lamb. But until the lamb gets here, until Jesus can show up, I'm going to let you use the blood of an animal to cover your sins until I can show up. So, this is significant. And in the next verse, he says, And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Man, this is powerful. You got to have a relationship with God to do this. You can't be coming to church once every three months and then putting your son up and getting ready to kill your son. You've got to know you know God. Amen. And I want to make sure that I know God so if any strange thing comes to pass that I'm hearing in my ears, I'll be able to do it because I know his voice. Amen. That I'm not just playing around wearing some Christian T-shirt going around, look at me, I'm a Christian, but I know him, praise God, because I have intimate relationship with him and that he is first in my life. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Verse 10, and Abraham stretched forth his hand, and he took the knife. He's getting ready to, he's getting ready to slay his son. But you got to realize what Abraham had. He had this vision in his head, I'm going to be a father of many nations. I'm going to be a father of many nations. I'm going to have a seed that outnumbers the stars. He's been meditating on the stars, been meditating on the, on the sand that's on the seashore. I'm a father of many nations. So he knew that if he had to kill his son, that God's going to have to do something, raise him up from the dead or something, because in order for God not to be a liar, then in Isaac shall your seed be. So something had happened. So Abraham was getting ready. He wasn't, he wasn't afraid or anything. He's like, I know God. I know God. I've been meditating. I've been fellowshipping with him at nighttime when the stars were out. I've been fellowshipping with him while I was working on my tan on the beach. I was fellowshipping with him. Amen. Amen. 
So he took that knife and he's getting ready to kill his son and to present him as a gift to God. But what he said was, I got to have faith. If God gave him to me, the only reason I have him is because he came from God anyway. If he asked for him back, I'm ready to do what I got to do. And you can't even do that with the lowest asset in the kingdom, money. Success is something we all want, but very few of us understand. True success is not defined by money and fame. The truest kind of success begins with God's undeniable presence in our lives. We want you to experience the God kind of success. Your relationship with God is going to take the foolishness out of you. It's going to convince you that's not the best thing to keep doing. It is your right relationship with God that will expose you to the benefit of the blessing. My success comes from me believing in what Jesus has already provided for me. You can also receive today's full message for only $7. Or for $50, you can receive the Grace-Based Success Collection. This popular set includes the Grace-Based Success CD series, the Fight the Fear of Giving CD series, and the Financial Stewardship MIDI book. Order now at creflodollarministries.org or call the number on the screen for more information. to see what God has for me. I want to pursue what God has for me. Whatever I need to do in order for God to do what he needs to do, I'm going to do it. Bless God. Dallas, Texas, in Chicago, Illinois. Creflo Dollar presents Change Experience 2020. Are you ready for your change? <laughs> you feel like you walk and it's like an earthquake going across the mirror. Just to be saturated in the Word with some teaching for like an extended period of time, that's just something you got to get into. There's some stuff that won't be the same when you return back home. You honestly think that God needed you in order to fix it, but what God needed you to do is to rest. Don't miss this free event April 24th at 7 p.m. in Dallas, Texas, and June 12th at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 7 p.m. in Chicago, Illinois. Seats are limited. Don't delay. Go online and register now. I want you all to know that this broadcast is made available by people like you with a heart for the Lord and a sincere desire to help produce change in someone else's life. Your financial contributions to Creflo Dollar Ministries enable us to broadcast the message of God's grace all over the world. The testimonies that come in from people who watch these messages daily prove that this broadcast truly does change lives. It wouldn't be possible without people like you who faithfully sow financial seeds into this ministry. And for that, we say thank you, and God bless you. When you make financial donations to Creflo Dollar Ministries, those resources are distributed immediately where you requested. If you do not designate your contribution, rest assured it is used for one of our many outreach endeavors. We are eternally grateful for your faithful financial support. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe.